Thanks. Um, hi, and welcome. Thank you. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, we had um, Jack Ma from Alibaba and Elon Musk on stage in Shanghai talking about AI. I watched that. Yeah. That was weird. It was super weird. <laughs> um, they were both weird. It's worth watching if you haven't. Um, but what was really notable to me, uh, you know, Elon Musk, of course, was really skeptical about AI as he's, as he's been before. And uh, Jack Ma was much more sort of gung-ho. Um, but what was notable to me was that Europe wasn't on stage. And it seems to me that there's sort of three fronts here in this kind of conversation about AI and where we're going and the future of tech. And Europe presents a very particular kind of take on that. And you've certainly talked about that before. How do you see the front lines, if you will? So to uh, draw up the big picture first, I mean, there's an, an er American version of AI, which is the big tech companies, uh, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, developing AI for their products and all the services they want to bring to us and where they're moving closer and closer to, you know, taking over everything from transportation to healthcare to, you know, it, news feeds everything mm -hmm. and and then there is the Chinese version which is of course using AI to monitor the people to have a state capitalism uh, where you basically if you jaywalk you will be posted on a screen uh, hi Ida Augen you just jaywalked we know who you are we'll put it on your credit score mm -hmm. and it's used you know uh, really to 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 reinforce the power of the state. Uh -huh. So you have this, uh, I would call it, if I'm being a little bit, you know, tough, I would call it like this Wild West uh, um, tech imperialism from the uh, US, where you have like uh, the companies just doing it, and where's the determinism of, if we don't do it, somebody else will do it. So if you try to have a moral argument with uh, the American tech companies, they kind of like, somebody will do it no matter what, so we should do it, we should be the leaders. And you have the Chinese version, which is this uh, state version. So I think there's a huge space for Europe in between those two positions with uh, believing in what we come from, mm. in a way. Believing what, do you, what do you mean by that? So believing in the, the European civilization, so to speak, <laughs> that we can actually put, uh, put our morals in, in front and say what is important to people and then try to regulate this development. So we basically make sure that this does not become uh, the, the, the strongest that wins or the state, uh, but it, that we protect every individual's freedom um, by doing things together and in a regulated manner. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's a really big chance for Europe. We've spent the last 10, 15 years just handling crises, right? Financial crisis, refugee crisis, Brexit. And now it's time for Europe with this new commission and with this new kind of like trying to reorient ourselves after, after Brexit, it's not over yet, mm -hmm. to find a way to, to use this AI for something good. And there I don't mean like Jack Ma, he was saying, you know, AI stands for Alibaba, Alibaba <laughs> Intelligence, <laughs> which was like, was yeah, okay, come on. And, and this whole, you're like mm -hmm. you called it gung-ho, like, well, it's all clappy happy. Right. So it, it has to be really also understanding that in order to have this freedom and the protection of the individual, we need pretty strict regulation. Mm -hmm. And we need pretty strict ideas of where we are going and what we're going to use AI for. Because like, I think like, one of the things that's really... Um, really fascinating about AI is that we actually can't even, it's like death in a way, it, you can't imagine it. Mm -hmm. It's beyond the, the limits of comprehension, right? Like we can't imagine what it would be like to have this kind of knowledge that exponentially uh, becomes greater all the time and, and, and creating basically a knowledge base that is uh, exponentially smarter than us. Um, so it's hard, like how do we as regulators or ordinary citizens even keep up yeah. with all of that. And because like, I think one of the things that we've seen in the past 10, 15 years with, through all these crises have been that regulators and ordinary people have only sort of belatedly caught up with all the developments and they have been really dramatic developments and, and our society has really been fundamentally changed. Yeah. How, how do we keep up? How do we stay on top so of what's going on? So of course AI is a real race and that it's, it's hard as a regulator to not, you know, to not just get in the way with all the wrong rules. But I also want to challenge the idea that this is, you know, this general AI is already there and that we should be looking at out of control AI and that this super intelligence will take over because it's actually derailing our attention 
from what's going on right now, which is somebody's taking all our data, somebody's using it to sell things back to us, to control our lives, to make us uh, spend more time on the screen that we want to. So it's actually stealing our lives now. And while we run around and talk about Elon Musk's fiction or f th what he's scared of and Hawking's and whatever, they are actually just continuing this. Mm -hmm. So I, w I would say, you know, yes, this is a real threat that it will get out of control in some way, but I'm more afraid of what's it going to be used for in two or three years in war zones, or what is it when you use a drone and facial recognition and you use a technology that's basically wrong 20% of the time. I don't know if you've seen facial recognition. It's, it was supplied to the American Congress and it was wrong 20% of the time, especially with black people, right, by right. the way. So it's also very prejudiced. Yep, yep. So I, I think we should be looking at, leave that fiction to Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's look at Europe. Let's look at how we get data back to people, make sure that we own our data ourselves, that we can access it, that we can move it, and that all the data that we are u collecting in Europe, also in the public sector, which people actually have a lot of they believe in the public sector still mm. in Europe. That data, for instance, in healthcare, how can we use that to improve people's lives? Not to steal their time, not to take their money, but honestly to give them better health, to solve the problem with food. Like food is such a big issue. We're going to be needing 50% more food than we produce today. The next 40 years, we will produce more food than the last 10,000 years on this planet. We don't know how to do it. We don't know to, how to do it in an efficient way mm -hmm. where AI can really, really help us. If you use AI to look at how plants grow or how they absorb nutrients and when they need light, and you can actually do indoor farming much more efficiently. We need to solve the problem of water. Half of the world will live in water areas with water scarcity, and we need to solve the problem with clean energy um, and getting that into our transportation sector, into the agriculture sector, into our energy sector. And these jobs, we should be focused at like this, mm -hmm. instead of running around after these fictions of Silicon Valley or, uh, or going the way where China uses it to monitor and keep the, the people down. So, mm -hmm. so, so it, was, it was interesting to me in, in Davos earlier this year, there was a lot of talk about Europe as a third way mm -hmm. on these conversations about AI and the future of tech. You talk a lot about also the little, the little companies that are doing these amazing things. Can you talk a little bit about that and the circular economy and how, how that all fits in? Yeah. So if we do this right, uh, we can really try to solve what I believe is our biggest problem, which is climate change and which is resource scarcity. And these two actually come together. We cannot solve climate change unless we find a smarter way of using our resources. So take, for instance, the car. So an, a car drives on average 5% of the time. It's ridiculous. You spend all your money on it, it drives 5% of the time. It just sits in the driveway yeah, idle. 95% yeah, 95% of the mm -hmm. time. And by the way, you are, you're, it's idling half of that time mm -hmm. or 25%. You're looking for parking and there's one person in it. So why don't we use AI and the, the data we have on people's mo transportation habits and their, the mobility? We, we know this and the telco has this data. They're using it. We should ask for that data from the public sector and see how we can set up a system of mobility where people actually feel that it is just as convenient because they basically can access a car very, very easily. We can create small bus systems where basically like Uber Pool, it doesn't have to be Uber. It should be, I mean, maybe we can make a... What, I, what is Anders Bevelse called, I think? Yeah. <laughs> uh, a collective, it's a... Uh, yeah, collective yeah. version where basically the drivers own the platform themselves. Yeah. It doesn't have to be owned by anybody. Where literally you can have a, a car f with an algorithm figuring out how to transport four people from A to Z within, you know, maybe it will take you two minutes longer than if the car was driving direct directly, but you don't have to look for parking. And the car is coming to your home, and you will only pay one fourth of the what a taxi costs mm -hmm. you, right? So it sounds like you should be. A, it sounds like you should be a, doing a startup. <laughs> has, has nobody already figured this one uh, out? Well, I think the public sector could do this. Yeah. And it's not to say that the that it's not couldn't be the private should be on the platform, but you know, offering that data or saying if you are, if you run a transport company in Denmark, you can do that platform. Mm. We actually are close to it. Uh, Movia or who or whatever they call at the moment are actually trying to put all like the, the bike rides, uh, you might like them or not, the kickers you could probably put on, on, on that platform to the, the, 
car sharing mobility solutions, the public transit, the cars, the, tra the trains, the buses. So the, 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 the person can look, I want to go from there to there. These are my four options. These are the four prices. And I don't need to own a car. Yeah. So that would be one way of solving a huge resource problem. We could do the same with food. You know, mm. We know we lose 50% of all food in the value chain. We know that we don't get the nutrients back on the field like we used to do. They get burned. You know, how can we close that loop with using the, the data we know now and, and using AI to see the patterns that we are not yet seeing? And I could go on. <laughs> like, how do we make sure that we get quality products that we want to use for a much longer time, that we want to share? Because the circular economy is, is basically about keeping materials in use at all times and not downgrading them and not taking in new resources if you can use some, but some resources that are already there. So making the, it, I mean, it is indeed self-sustaining in a way it's of circular, it's right? It's loop, right? Yeah. So, so this one should be, it's, this is pretty re easy to recycle, but this one's almost impossible because right. you've mixed like metals and this, uh, you foam know, foam, and the, whatever. Yeah. It yeah. makes it impossible, but you can really design things so that they can be used for a longer time, so that they can be recycled. Mm -hmm. Looking at buildings, for instance, we, mm -hmm. when we talk about climate change, we've been talking about buildings on the energy consumption. How much energy does a building use? And we've had all these regulations and standards for energy consumption. But honestly, the biggest CO2 impact of a building is the CO2 in the materials right. that are used to build that house. So we've had a wrong focus in a way, or, or a, a one-sided focus. But if we start to look at how, which materials do we build will, what do we have of value in that building, in that building, how can it be remodeled? This is where I think all the Danish and the European startups and the technology they're developing, they should look into solving these problems. Mm -hmm. And that's where AI could come, come be brought to bear. Yeah, that's where it could become AI for, for good mm -hmm. and not for Alibaba. So um, that, also, that sounds wonderful. That makes me really like very hopeful for the future. <laughs> There's this great uh, application. The world is not doomed. It's not just the American Wild West capitalism, as you described, or this sort of uh, uh, super surveillance state in China. But like, here is this like more utopian, uh, great future where AI becomes a force of good. What does it take, though, practically, for us to get there? Because like that's all very well and good, but there will be the. Pr I mean, we live in a globalized world, of course, and in a global economy, where the same products. Uh, that the Americans, for example, are have introduced, like they, we all kind of interact with them every day. You know, like how do we, how does our model become the model, if yeah. you will? So the GDPR, the European mm -hmm. uh, Data Protection, uh, data yeah. protection um, Regulation, is annoying, and it's probably also easier for the big ones to comply, but at least when they're complying in Europe, they use, they it becomes their global value set. Mm -hmm. And those who regulate the markets literally set the standards. Right. So I, I think that is one way to keep going down, mm -hmm. that we keep moving further and further down the, uh, that road that literally your data belongs to you and makes it, make it easier to have data portability that you can move your data from one platform to the other. What about the day where you get the Facebook where it's honestly you who decides who's in your network. Mm. You who decide who you want to see. Like I can get offended that 35,000 people went in and decided they wanted to follow me as a politician. But if I want to talk to them, I have to pay Facebook. Unless I'm being really, really uh, angry or really, really funny and go viral. I can't just talk to Wait, them. Which you're very good at, yeah, by the way. Yeah, well, well, I try, you know, I try to, you know, use the system that's there. But yeah. I would love a system where if somebody had decided they followed me mm -hmm. or that this is my network, that it's not Facebook curating it. Mm -hmm. So I believe that if data portability was easier, we would see people start choosing these platforms where they can get, you know, where they know that you only look at my picture if I asked you to do it. Mm -hmm. You never open my, my text messages or my calendar or anything unless mm -hmm. I invited you. So that kind of transparency we have to keep pushing for. Okay, and Anna, can I just interject on that? Because that's interesting to me because I live in New York and I w I've been really uh, fascinated by the way in which a conversation that started basically in, in Copenhagen and Brussels and Margrethe Vestager, of course, was super key in, a, in, a, in sort of 
bringing this forward on, on the regulatory side. Um, like that, that conversation has really now translated to the US and we're now talking about things and, and data regulation and, and privacy as a, as a, as a, as a right yeah. uh, in, in, in the US in a way that I've never seen before. Uh, whereas before it was famously, you know, tech companies could do whatever and like the market would fix it and it was all fine. Now we're seeing like a big initiative in California and a big fight and actually sort of um, everybody coming together. Yeah. Consumers, the Democrats, the mm -hmm. Trump administration, all kind of saying, okay, actually the, the system as we know it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and that's been sort of fascinating how we, again, Europe, uh, if you will, like the European uh, way has, has, has won the day, if you will. Yeah. Well, in a time where we're not sure that Western civilization will survive <laughs> or democracy will survive in the US, it's, it's good if we can move in in other ways. And the mm -hmm. regulated market might actually be one of the strongest things Europe can export. Because we've been talking too long about free market and free trade, which is a fiction. Mm -hmm. Because free trade does not exist. Regulated tra trade exists. Where you have rules for the products you produce, how you use them. And that model, I mean, if we can't, if we can't you know, reintroduce uh, democracy in the US, we might reintroduce a regulated market because the, the companies start to comply and the consumers ask for it. So I think that that is one way where Europe could go back in a leading role. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and I think Europe should really straighten its back because honestly, I can tell you like Mariana Mazzucato and MIT, I, they were in having this conversation also in around Davos, um, that MIT was saying like GDPR will destroy all growth in Europe, it will shut down all the small SMEs, it's only the big ones that can comply. Look at growth has downturned since May 18th. And I'm like, well, May 18th, that's kind of like the Brexit date, you right, know, kind of right. might also be the, the reason. security <laughs> of like what what's going to happen. And, uh, and you know, so, so I, I think we have to show that we should not listen to those stories that Europe is going to destroy itself if we regulate technology. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, I think we should truly believe that if we can make these regulations smart and what we're good at in Europe is actually to have a, an honest conversation between companies and regulators. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at, at China, I think you they talk behind the scenes, they fix things, but it's not like you have a public open, open debate. Right. And in US, it's, uh, I don't know how that conversation, mm. I have never really been really fascinated about that conversation. It's hardcore lobbyism and it's like hitting down. And, yeah. and whereas in Europe, you know, also the way the commission works is really to have long engaging conversations mm. with with industry right. and with um, the companies. And I think if, if people get on board on the GDPR, they fought it for a long time. If they get on board, we will also be able to make it smarter, make it more usable for, for SMEs, um, make sure that we invest the, the, the research money for these areas, that, it, that we just don't go like, oh, panic, we need to invest a shitload of money in AI. Mm. But no, let's say, okay, what do we want to do with AI? Mm. What, are, what are we gonna, what kind of applications do we want? What is it for a Europe that we are imagining? Right. And, and, and instead of a chaotic Europe that is basically just handing crises, um, it could be a Europe that really protects people's life quality and solve some of these global problems. So it's really about like, it's, it's about a vision of the future where uh, we're all stakeholders in this development of that particular um, happier, more um, uh, like a future where, you know, we're combating climate change or, or doing mm -hmm. all these things, but with companies and startups, et cetera, on the same side that we're all, that we're all kind of on the same, same yes. side in this fight because we ultimately we have the same vision of, of what kind of society yes. we want to live in. And, and I, I believe if you look into the American big tech companies, most of their greatest engineers are European. Mm. And so we would say, oh, they have all the knowledge, they've developed all this AI. Yeah, but if we can get the people back, yeah. look what will happen in Europe. Honestly, if we can get those engineers in Google and Apple and Facebook and Amazon to move back to Europe, because they get so fed up with living in San Francisco where you have to step over homeless or to live in a society where the polarization of Facebook is now destroying democracy or looking how their technology is not doing all the good things that Alibaba intelligence told the world they would do or f Facebook told the world they would do and move 
move here. And mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in that sense, I'm a little bit like, okay, Europe first. So it's more, it's, it's rather than like the, the famous um, Zuckerberg credo, like move fast and break things. It's move slower and create things maybe. Yeah, yeah. I uh, like that one. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think a friend of mine, he's working on what he calls the slow web, mm -hmm. which is in a way like e ecology of food that in the web where you know what is, where it's, what is there, where you know what your data is used for, where you um, honestly, you don't get on pages that are designed for t to take all your time, never ending pages. Like the newspaper, it used to end, right? Mm. And you would feel like, oh, I read the newspaper. It's over. Whereas <laughs> Facebook, it's like, it's never ever <laughs> ending. Yeah. And you yeah. can just spend all the time in the world and we get this FOMO and mm. young people get you know, frightened. Like, what if we create a technology that basically has closure? Mm. Like, crazy ideas like that. Yeah. And I think, um, I think that is the chance for Europe. And I think we should straighten our backs. We should know what's going on in the rest of the world, that we're not world leaders. We, I think for too many years, Europe thought we were world leaders. Then we had 10, 15 years where we thought we were world losers. And now I think Europe is still the world's biggest market. It's mm -hmm. still the place where we have because we believe in every individual human being, we have the chance of, in community as a society, to advance and move forward with moral, with protecting each other, with communities that we put at the heart of human life. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's a much more healthy way of developing. So, so uh, in your previous job, what were some of the most more exciting things you saw also on the technology front, like uh, of young companies, European companies doing exciting things? My previous job? Oh, like uh, with the environment. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's still my job. Yeah. Um, um, I think uh, what's happening in food right mm -hmm. now is very interesting. Yeah. Because we we see um, we see the circular economy moving into food production, mm -hmm. where where we've seen farmers, you know, they would go out and they put a lot of nutrients on their fields, and they would lose mm -hmm. all this, and it would become pollution. And they would, you know, become more and more efficient at using their tractor or getting mm. the cow to breed that. Whereas new technology is in a way shifting the whole system. Mm -hmm. So if you have AI to grow plants and mm -hmm. you know, you, you use 95% less water, no pesticides. And, and so how does that work so specifically? It's like, like yesterday they pr presented this company called Next Food, which is mm -hmm. an indoor farming company where you literally monitor all the plants. They have a artificial light. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, going, you know, giving, so the, the, if you mo measure inside the plant, you can measure with AI the plant health, mm. and each plant as actually have a different growth profile. Mm. So this plant needs nutrient now, and this one needs water, and this one needs kale or potassium, and this one needs phosphorus, and you know, it, they might need it at different times, so they grow, AI actually grows plants faster than human beings. Wow. So there was an, a test in bargaining in university mm. where the AI beat the human beings that could walk into the plants, but the AI measuring how the plant was doing, was doing better. Yeah. So we will have more, when we have to produce food for a whole lot of people, we'll right. have to go down that very efficient road and mm. do also indoor farming because we like a lot of land. Right. But we also have to go another way, which is, I think, more locally grown food, more natural food, where people learn how to love the food that they're eating, understand where it comes from, doesn't throw it away because mm -hmm. they have a respect. So I honestly see a twofold trend. And sometimes these trends are fighting, like the, the very organic local foods, they don't mm -hmm. like this high tech. Mm -hmm. I truly believe we have to go down both paths. Uh, one because of life quality and better products, and one because we really have to produce a whole lot of food yeah. for a lot of people coming into to the market. But the, 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 the organic way can maybe get people to want something different than meat. Mm. This one will produce artificial meat, which right. is less, less damaging to the environment. Damaging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This one will create better food. Right. Okay, so I think we have to go both ways. And how does it work though with like, because there's also a lot of talk about then what happens to the, um, to the jobs that are eliminated in the post. Like, so like, why should we even have farmers if we can have AI farmers that are much more efficient, yeah. et cetera. Like there's a, there's a big kind of fear around the elimination, mass elimination of jobs. Look, the agricultural sector have already eliminated those jobs. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. there are like 11,000 farmers, professional farmers back left in Denmark. Mm. If we have a food sector now coming in, producing all these local foods, getting you know food production to be thought out in new ways, mm -hmm. I'm sure that's where a lot of the new jobs are. You, don't you might not need all this land to have a 
to have your own farm, mm -hmm. you might actually just need three or four hectares to do, you know, more local foods or more, pro not processed is the wrong word, but food where you have done more to it. So instead of creating like 10 million pigs, we might create this very beautiful ham that we've done here, you know, mm -hmm. and it, that's a lot more craftsmanship that goes into that. Mm -hmm. And I think we should look at now how we can start paying people to do things that are not just efficient, but also gives us life quality. Mm. So for me, it's life quality that it's not a robot sitting when I check into a hotel. Right. It really gives me a lot of life quality that there's a person, person sitting yeah. there. And I think we should hire much more people to, to make life nice mm. and, and to care for each other. Because I think that, that is some of the places where the new jobs also are. are. So, so I'm afraid on the short term that we will lose. I, I, I treat in that sense, I, I believe this, um, what's the um, Yang candidate? That mm -hmm. he's right Andrew in that. Yang, yeah. Andrew Yang mm. is right in the sense that four million jobs were lost in Ohio and mm. Michigan and mm. these places and that that to automation. Mm. He's completely wrong in his solution, if you ask me. Right. That's a different story. But the automation has happened already. It's mm. taken away a lot of jobs. And, and on the short term, I am really concerned about people with no education yeah. and no worldview that will make them feel, you know, not be afraid of moving mm. other places. I'm not afraid for the Danish people and they're not afraid of technology because right. we are trying to say, how can we embrace and tame technology? So instead of saying, we don't like it or just come and grab us, whatever. Mm. We're trying to say, how can we embrace and tame it? How can we regulate it? So it's still, so in other words, it's still, because I think sometimes, as you talked about earlier, like the American version or the debate in America becomes a little bit scaremongering, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit like the Elon Musk, like, oh my God, you know, AI is coming, we're all doomed, the robots are coming, yeah. our overlords, etc. You really think like that this is like a way, actually what, what can happen here is that we are still the overlords, if you will, but mm -hmm. we are still in charge. We're still um, having, um, using technology to further the, the ultimate aims, mm -hmm. which is a better society. Yes where we have a better use of resources and a better quality of life for as many people as possible. Yes, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Mm. That's a good thing. Civilization has had 6,000 years to develop. So the rules that we're going to make, we don't have to reinvent them. We no. might have to apply them in different ways. And sometimes people developing AI say, you know, it's just so complicated. You have no clue what's mm. going on. It, by the way, it's black box, the whole thing. We don't even know how right. it works. And I don't think we should accept that. Answer. So you think some kind of transparency in the same way that people are calling for algorithmic transparency, yes, you think there should be some kind of... Definitely, but also to sometimes say, you know, oh, so, so there is a murder committed, Alexa has uh, Listened recorded in. it, yeah. mm. and it's like, it's not a discussion whether or not that's a piece of evidence. It is. Right. So give it to the judge, you yeah. know? It's not like we live in this new tech world. If right. you have something which is a crime, yeah, yeah. killing that should be given. And there are so many rules that we could apply today mm. if we thought, if, if more regulators and more politicians also understood what was going on in the tech world. And that's sort of like my last, to my own piece of the world, the politicians literally are completely lost mm. when it comes to technology. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, really glad to, uh, to talk to you here. So I'll was try to do my best to <laughs> wake him up and you can do it too. Yeah, thanks. Really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.